Let's check out what's going on in my fall vegetable garden, plus tips on ways you can improve your winter garden, all coming up next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. This is a show about garden design and ways to blur the lines between inside and out. Now we're in one of my favorite garden rooms in my garden. You see this is the vegetable or kitchen garden and it's sectioned off from other parts of the garden and here I grow great delicious vegetables. Plus I have a few of my feathered friends enjoying a beautiful fall day with me today. And in today's show I'll take you inside for a recipe that's delicious for the fall table. And we'll also take a peek under the frost blankets at some of the great greens growing in my raised beds. And I'll show you how to add a little color to this garden room each spring. All it takes is a little work this fall. Plus, bringing tender plants in can be a bit confusing. You know, what sort of protection should you give them? What time of year should you bring them in? How they should be acclimated? We'll answer all of those questions. That's coming up. Now back to the vegetables. <music> You may wonder how I could get so excited about a fall vegetable garden. Well, just look at all the bounty here. Everything from red mustard, various types of lettuce, parsley, and even broccoli. Now, in the summer, I have tomatoes, squash, peppers, and all sorts of herbs in here. But this time of year, and into the early spring, I like to grow cool weather crops. One of my favorites is lettuce. Just look at some of these varieties. There's butter crunch, red sail, oak leaf, and deer tongue. Try combining a little of this fresh lettuce with some broccoli or arugula. Add some olive oil, a dash of balsamic vinegar, and some salt and pepper, and you'll have a delicious salad fresh from your garden. Lettuce is a snap to grow, but we'll get to that a little later. First, I want to talk about these raised beds. This is really the way to go. Raised beds are so easy. What I like about them is that they're contained, and that from season to season, I can make sure that the soil is fertile and rich. Since I have heavy clay soil in my garden, I create a blend of half garden soil to one quarter well rotted manure to one quarter compost or humus. Now depending on your garden soil, you may want to create your own mixture. But what your goal should be is to create a healthy, disease-free blend of soil that has plenty of organic matter and drains well. Just remember, it's always a good idea to wash fruits and vegetables that you've grown at home, even if you don't use chemicals or pesticides due to the fact that soil may be on the plants. Now the other thing I like about these beds is that they're real time savers. You see, by keeping them small like this, I can sit on the edge, I can plant, weed, or harvest by simply reaching across, and from this point over is halfway from my reach. So one bed I can plant in just a few minutes. Now one of the handy devices I love to use is this little beekeeping stool. It's a stool that I used to use when I'd work on my beehives, and now I bring it out into the garden. It's been with me for about 20 years, and I've had to replace the legs from time to time, but it's the perfect size and very convenient. I can just bring it out here and sit and enjoy the space. For over 47 million Americans, arthritis makes gardening much more of a challenge. According to the Arthritis Foundation, gardening can be a great activity for maintaining joint flexibility as well as range in motion. Do your work in the garden during the time you feel best, but always warm up your joints and muscles first by walking or stretching, and avoid doing the same task in the same position for too long. Save your energy by keeping your water source nearby to minimize carrying watering cans or hoses, and make sure your tools are kept in a place close at hand also, you'll find gardening in raised beds and containers can make tending a garden easier by minimizing bending over. So if the quality of the soil doesn't sell you completely on the idea of creating one of these raised beds, then the easy maintenance surely will. Now I was inspired by a visit to Mount Vernon, the home of George and Martha Washington, and I returned to my garden and designed these beds. You see, in a small garden room like this, it would have been impractical to lay out long rows but these small geometric beds break things up, giving you a place to walk between the beds and also to find spaces to group together different combinations of plants and in every season. 
Okay, how about some pointers on building these raised beds? There are three things you need to keep in mind. First, you want to start with a good sized piece of lumber. What I'm using here are two by 12s. The next thing you need to keep in mind is the weather resistance. You don't want wood that will rot. You can use redwood, it can be a little expensive. You can use cypress, uh, it might be difficult to find. What I used here was cedar. And you can see these beds have held up for almost 10 years. Now, the third thing you want to keep in mind is the corner and how the bed goes together. You want to miter the corners and use wood screws to hold them together. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that lettuce is really easy to grow. You can actually sow several crops in a season, whether that be spring or fall. You can purchase lettuce and cell packs already started and then plant them into the beds. Or you can sow seeds, which will germinate in about a week. Now, let's talk about soil for just a moment. It's very important, mainly that you have soil that is well drained, no heavy clay. Lettuce just won't perform in that. And that's the beauty of these raised beds because you can amend or create any soil you like. What I have here is a soil that if you reach in and you grab a handful of it and you squeeze it like this and you open it up, it falls apart. You see, it doesn't make a hard ball. And the way I've achieved that is I've integrated a lot of sand, a lot of compost or humus into the soil and over time, I've used quite a bit of manure. That's where my little feathered friends come in. Not only do they produce eggs, but they also produce a good soil amendment. Now, one more tip. To stay ahead of pests, I like to rotate my raised bed crops from season to season and from year to year in order to stay one step ahead of these pests. Now, I'd like to take a moment and talk about gardening on the vertical. Now you may think, well, this is an odd time of year to be doing that, but actually it's a very good time when you take a look at my hyacinth bean vines and see what the frost did the last couple of weeks. Just about wiped it out and it's time to take the vines off. But you see, I love this plant and what I'm doing now is I'm saving some of these dried seed heads. When you open them up, you can see the most beautiful seed. I like to save them for planting next year and to give to friends. Kids love these because they germinate in no time and they grow like a jack and the beanstalk vine and they cover themselves with the most amazing flowers. Really very quickly in the season from the time you plant them about two months into the summer they can begin flowering. Gardening on the vertical is really a great space saver. For this vine I created a wire trellis. I sometimes use string. I first drilled four holes into my fence in a square pattern. Just imagine each of these in the corner of the square, and then I placed one in the middle. Then I inserted eyelet screws into each of the holes I made. Next, I ran the wire through these eyelet screws, forming a square pattern with an X in the middle. To plant the hyacinth bean vine, I first filled peat pots with moistened soil and planted each of the seeds in the pot. These can be started inside two to three weeks before the last frost, and can be planted outside after the danger of frost has passed. Now, you may want to take and insert a slender bamboo stick or a branch by each of the plant to train your bean vine to grow up on the trellis. Just be sure to check on your vine every few days to help train it up your trellis for more even coverage. You know, I also use vertical elements in my garden for making places to work, like this tool shed. On one side of this building, I have a potting bench. It's a great place in the spring when I'm constantly starting seedlings and needing to reach for pots in a hurry. Of course, saving space is really important in every garden when you get right down to it. In fact, on my loggia or covered breezeway, I've converted an armoire into a potting place of sorts. It's ideal for holding a host of items from seed packets and hand tools to fragile pots and garden markers. Now, if you're around my garden long enough, you'll know that I don't throw anything away. I like to use everything in some way. You can always create interesting things or spaces in the garden, like here. This is called waddling. What I've used are just twigs that I've gathered in the garden. I made a series of stakes that made a crisscross, and then I just weaved the twigs in between, which created this division of four different triangles. Now, in the winter, you get a beautiful snowfall. It looks great. In the spring, I have lettuce, I have parsley, arugula and spinach in the various places, and in summer, well, I've raised a beautiful crop of lilies here. Now earlier I just touched on one of my favorite bulbs for summer, the lily. They're great for cutting, but in the spring it's hard to beat the tulip. And man do I pack out this entire vegetable garden with tulips. They're perfect for growing in these raised beds. 
Now, what I like to do is plant a variety of tulips, and I plant early, mid, and late season bloomers. You see, this extends the opportunity for me to cut them and bring them into the house. And in order to get results like these in this vegetable garden, I have to plant tulips now. Now, let me give you a few tips. Now, you'll want to plant your tulips in an area that gets good drainage, and you want to plant them deep, about eight inches from the bottom of the bulb to the soil line. I fertilize a little with a slow-release fertilizer in the fall, and then I top dress them with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer in the spring. After the blooms have faded, I remove the spent flowers and allow the foliage to die back naturally. This helps the bulb store energy for next year's bloom. Now, if you've ever grown tulips before, you know that you plant them in the fall and that the bulbs have to go through a period of chilling for them to perform. Now, in my garden here in zone seven, I don't have tulips that really are reliably perennial. Most of what I grow, I grow as annuals. I just dig them up and compost them after they flower. However, there is one variety that I've found to be more reliably perennial. That's one called Lady Jane. It's Tulip Clusiana. You see, I have it planted in a bed of ivy, and it comes up through the ivy under a rhododendron and flowers beautifully. It's been flowering in the same place for about seven years. Now, this leads me to another topic I want to talk to you about. You see, during the summer months, many of us bring some of our favorite house plants, tender plants, out onto our patios and porches. But when it starts to get cold, you need to provide those plants with some protection. Let me show you a structure I built expressly for this purpose. Now this is my lath house. It serves as a great place for plants when conditions are extreme. For instance, in the summer, when it gets really hot, these laths across the top provide shade. In winter, well, I can seal it with plastic and it stays warm. Architecturally, it reflects the style of my house. I use some columns that match the front porch. It's a lean-to against the garage, so I painted it the same color as the garage, so it works really well. And this Dutch door, well, it allows me to seal off the bottom and open up the top here for ventilation. Now, the lattice panels around the exterior reflect the lattice panels I used on my lozier covered breezeway. There, I painted them dark green and set them on a diagonal. Here, I used a square grid, but in both cases, I used one by four lumber. I like the larger size and the standard lattice that you might pick up at a home improvement store. Now on the inside, you can see I've got lots of shelf space, because I love to use this place as a potting area during the spring. And in the winter, well, I pack it full of plants. You can hardly walk through here. This structure provides excellent protection from the elements, but what about ice and snow in the garden? While the plants in the lath house will certainly be taken care of, you might wonder about the plants that are left out in the elements. Let's step into the winter garden for a few minutes for some tips on protecting plants from ice and snow. Over the years, I've learned that being prepared for old man winter's visits can save me a lot of time and worry. So here are some tips that may be helpful to you as you prepare your garden for the cold days ahead. Start by mulching your flower beds. You might be surprised how much protection a layer of mulch will provide your plants over the winter. Use bark, straw, pine needles, or leaves. I even use my old Christmas tree and garland. In my vegetable garden, I like using frost blankets like these to protect young plants. You can also keep winter vegetables growing longer by using a movable cold frame. To keep my tree roses from being damaged, I protect them from extreme temperatures by wrapping them with burlap cloth. Shrubs and trees can be some of the most expensive investments in our gardens. So let's take a look at some ways to keep ice and snow from damaging them. I've learned that tying up certain hedges and large shrubs, like this boxwood, can keep the snow from weighting down the plant's limbs. And knocking the snow off trees and shrubbery is a good idea. It will keep plants from bending and breaking. But don't try to knock the ice off your plants. Let the ice naturally melt to avoid damaging limbs and foliage. These are just a few suggestions that you can put to use that will take the worry out of winter. And don't forget, snow can actually make a good insulator for some of your plants, especially when you start to see little spring bulbs and perennials emerging early. A blanket of snow will actually help hold the ground temperature closer to 28 to 32 degrees, which when you think about it, is actually warmer than the wind chill. And as the snow melts, it becomes a valuable source of water for plants, as well as replenishing nitrogen in the soil. 
While melting snow can benefit our gardens, ice is a different story, particularly when it's on paths and walkways. It can be treacherous. So when trying to eliminate ice, use something other than salt. Sand is a good choice because it won't hurt the plants once it melts and gets swept off the walk into the yard. And sawdust is another environmentally friendly choice. And so are commercial products that are calcium chloride based. Sodium chloride or ordinary table salt may melt the ice, but it will also kill your grass and flowers when it comes in contact with them. Snow and ice may be a nuisance, but we all have to remember, it's all part of the winter season and nature's way of getting your garden ready for spring. Now let's shake off the chill of winter for a while. There, that's better. I enjoy using house plants outdoors through the summer, but when I feel the crisp, cool air of fall, I know it's time to bring my house plants indoors. You see, you shouldn't wait until that first hard frost to take house plants and tropicals in. The change in temperature can be just too drastic. A handy rule of thumb to remember is that when temperatures outside become similar to those inside your house, it's a good time to make the transition. And once you get them inside, you want to make sure that the light conditions are similar to what they had outside. If you're not careful, you may be bringing in more than just your house plants. You see, hitchhikers can be a problem. During the summer, any number of pests can get in the soil and on your plants, and some of them are so small, you need a magnifying glass to see them. To keep these little stowaways from creating an infestation in your home, I like to saturate my house plants with an insecticide. I use an insecticidal soap because it's safe, and I always try to get the underside of the leaves. After spraying, I'll leave them outside for two or three days, give them one more check before I take them inside. As the days become shorter and your plants shift from an active growth cycle, they won't require as much water. So don't kill them with kindness by overwatering. Let me show you a plant that people always ask me about when they tour my garden. This is an agave. Yes, it's the same plant that they used to make tequila. This is a huge specimen, and it's a huge part of my fountain garden. What an important focal point. But I have to say, because of its size, it's become a real challenge to bring in for the winter. So what I do is I just roll it into my garage, urn and all, and keep it there over winter, just above freezing. But the trick is I don't water it at all. This plant is used to dry conditions, and for me to water it in a cold garage would just cause it to rot and decay. That's how I keep it alive. I guess it just goes to show you that when you find a plant that you really love, you'll go to extreme lengths to keep it, even though you have to carry it through some really tough weather conditions. Okay, I promised you earlier that we'd step into the kitchen where I have a great recipe for your fall dinner table. When fall officially arrives, I'm always ready for a change in the season and in the kitchen. Some things just feel like autumn, like dried apricots. I love the flavor of apricots, whether they're fresh or cooked. Even though the apricot harvest occurred back in the summer, we still have them available to us either dried or in cans. This is a great, simple recipe for a baked apricot dish. It only requires four ingredients. Now I'll warn you, this isn't for the diet conscious or those counting calories, but hey, we all have to splurge a little. Start by soaking four six ounce packages of dried apricots in boiling water. It'll take only about 15 minutes for them to rehydrate. Now you can substitute this with four 15 ounce cans of apricots if you like. With the apricots ready, I'll simply line half of them in the bottom of a two quart buttered casserole dish and follow by layering the remaining three ingredients on top. I layer three fourths cup of light brown sugar followed by a half a box of crackers broken into small pieces. On top of the crackers, I add one stick of butter then start over and layer them all again. Now I'll bake this for one hour in a preheated 300 degree oven. This dish is delicious served with pork, chicken, and even duck, and you may want to consider preparing it for a holiday dinner. I think it's delicious served as a dessert. All you have to do is put a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top. Hey there, welcome to the design studio. You know, I really enjoy getting photographs from you, the viewer, and examining what we might do to give the front of your house a little curb appeal. 
Now here we have a wonderful modern house. Looks like it was built in the 1960s and it faces the north. So what would we do to improve its looks? What would we do to modify it? Give it a little bit of a facelift. Well, let's talk about some of the things that we like about this. You've got a strong horizontal line here and the house is all neutral. So that gives us a blank canvas really to work on. You could do, use any sort of color you want with this neutral color, this sort of taupe gray brown. Um, I like this strong element here on the end, which looks like a Burford holly that's been legged up. This is a great thing to do with a, an overgrown shrub. Just raise the shades, if you will, and it can really bring a lot of style to the garden. I also like the fact that the path here is defined, in this case, with monkey grass or liriope, which contains it. Okay, so let's take a look at some things that we would do. Let's take some of those garden home principles and apply them. Now, what I'd like to do here is frame the view, if you will, and also provide a little screening. I would put a hedge on this side. Could be another holly hedge. You would get the dark green color that you have over here. You'd pull it over here to this side. And I'd let that grow up about six feet tall. Now we have a blank wall here. Maybe moving the rose over. This is a rose bush on a trellis. And I think maybe carrying the rose over here might be nice and let it grow against this blank slate or canvas, if you will, that end of the house. Then here, I would probably come in with a low mounding shrub. This is a north facing house. So a rhododendron might be nice there with then some low shrubs that would come across the front of the foundation. And then maybe we'd fill in here with some big leafed hostas. Whatever shrub I used here, I would use then a smaller version of it here. So let's say this is a soft pink rhododendron, then this might be a smaller, a dwarf version, maybe a slightly different color rhododendron. I would leave the monkey grass border, I like that. And I would probably define the edge with a low boxwood hedge along the drive, leaving about three feet of space between the driveway, three feet here with a ground cover. Or it could even be lawn. Depends on how wide the driveway is. If it's a narrow driveway, you're probably gonna need this space when you open up the car. So this I would probably leave as a lawn. All right, now I like the bench up here very much. Um, I think I would take a dwarf azalea and bring it along the foundation here, just as we did on this side. And then there's a lot of space here. Uh, looks like a container on the back side. I'd probably cluster some containers up under the porch and maybe just do them in a variety of ferns because again, we're facing the north. There's not gonna be a lot of light and you're gonna be up under that porch. So just some ferns here. And I would probably bring the basket down and also the house numbers down just a little bit. They seem a little high here. And then maybe on each side of the bench, a container on each side with a pair of hosta or maybe even impatience in them. And I think what I would also do is grow a vine here on this, maybe one of the evergreen jasmines or even Clematis armandii. Now what I like about this house is the color, it's a neutral, so any color palette you choose would work. These are just a few thoughts to help give it a little more curb appeal. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed being together as much as I have. You know, the fall is a wonderful time to be out in the garden and there's so much bounty for us to explore. Until next time, from the garden home, I'm Alan Smith.